Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Jen, thanks so much for sitting down with me. Sure, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Hey, most certainly. So the audience that don't know about you, can you yeah. sh- share a little bit about your, your story? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Bijan Durgi. I'm the CEO and founder of Artisan. Mm-hmm. And we're a temporary staffing company just specializing in the placement of digital, creative, and marketing talent. Mm-hmm. And uh, you want some more background? Sure. Uh, and I started the business in, uh, in Chicago. I came to Chicago with $1,000 in my pocket. Uh, I guess young and naive is a good thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I had a, a, a purpose in mind. Mm-hmm. And that purpose was, and that was the foundation of the company. It wasn't just about trying to make money, but it, the bigger purpose was creating a, a company that had a bigger purpose where that was advocating for talent that I represented. Mm-hmm. And obviously you're in a space, you know, the placement of talent. Right. It's an, an industry that's actually being disrupted by a lot of uh, fragmented workforce sure. and companies like Upwork and freelancers with all yeah, those things yeah. are kind of coming into that space. How do you see that industry changing um, in, in the coming years? Well, it's it's rapidly changing and mm-hmm. we're certainly trying to keep up with that change, keep up with that pace of change. Uh, the the onset of these um, I'd say co-working type of uh, shared uh, knowledge workers mm-hmm. uh, with the likes of Upwork and those types of agencies I would say, yeah, it's a great place, to, it's a great market to be in. Is it disrupting us? I don't see that disrupting us. Mm-hmm. I see that as a positive, mm-hmm. meaning that more and more companies are realizing that they can have access to freelance talent. Mm-hmm. It could be through an Upwork, but it could also be through an agency such as ours. Mm-hmm. I'd say the differentiator for us is really about, we really consider, it's not just matching talent. Mm-hmm. It's also matching the cultural fit and understanding the human element. And that's one thing that a computer or, or an AI really cannot do. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where we are making that cultural fit and understanding exactly what the, the client's needs are. Makes sense. Do you do full-time placement as well? Or? Yeah. Oh. yeah, we do full-time as well, uh, but we definitely do more contract work. Makes sense. Uh, and it ranging from, you know, could be one day to a year contract. And do you have a lot of direct agency clients or do you also have direct... Uh, clients that are like, let's say, an, a, you know, an internal marketing mm-hmm. team, do they also look for resources? Yeah, most actually we're working with uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, and we work with marketing firms, mm-hmm. uh, d- digital companies, manufacturing companies, non-for-profits. So the way we look at it is that we're actually more of an agnostic when it comes to clients, but mm-hmm. we're talent-centric. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on what the client is looking for, the kind of experience that they want. Maybe they want one year in healthcare, they want 10 years in financial, or they want a, a digital marketing expert, that's what we're looking for and that's what we will place. Makes sense. Obviously, you've been at this for a very long time, right. over 20 some years uh, running this, running this yes, staffing yes. agency. <laughs> uh, fairly fairly a, a successful story here. Mm. Um, you know, Obviously, there's been some hard lessons you've learned sure. through the process of building a company. Uh, what are some lessons you've learned through the through um, some, some I think at the beginnings was uh, really I was uh, more of a control freak. I was mm-hmm. really trying to be all things to all people mm-hmm. and n- didn't really want to. I was reluctant to give away uh, a lot of the uh, responsibilities. Mm-hmm. And I think through trial and error, I figured that if I didn't do that, I wasn't going to be able to grow. Mm-hmm. I got it to a certain level. Uh, but then I, and then learning, the key learnings was really trying to hire good people. Mm-hmm. And that, that's not an easy process. And I have a very stringent uh, screening process when it comes to hiring my people. Mm-hmm. The interview process is probably longer than, it's about a five hour process. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, it, that still I feel is not enough time in terms of trying to find a mm-hmm. good person for the team. Uh, and I think uh, and where I really learned how to do a good business, run a business was actually in the dot-com days. Mm. We were going back quite a, few to- quite a few years, but money was being thrown around and when, you have, when money's coming in, it hides a lot of problems. Mm. And I saw my business probably deteriorate from to about 80% in about mm. 18 months. Mm. And that's where I figured how to really start running a business, really being careful as to what I was doing and the decisions I was making. And uh, I, it almost, I had to start at ground zero again. And uh, that's where I really learned how to run a business. Mm. What were some of the key areas of the business you said, okay, this is not something suited for my skill set right. that you, you found like, hey, I have to delegate and elevate. 
what were some of those areas? Mainly with the financial side, I would say the, the marketing side. Uh, I'd stayed in sales for most of the time, and mm -hmm. then I, I really did was able to hire better salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly operations. That's really not something that I'm very good at, nor mm -hmm. that I want to be. Mm -hmm. And the other was accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm really... I'm just not good at it. So there are other people that are better at accountable, holding people accountable than I am. Yeah, and obviously, you know, everybody knows this, this cliche, like sure. working in the business versus working on the business. Yeah. And, and it's a lesson that you kind of have to learn the hard way. Right, I did. And <laughs> it seems like you, you learned that the hard way. And so what, what are some of the things you've seen um, in terms of things that other people that you've elevated, implemented, that you didn't see as far as like a blind spot, that you didn't have that? Um, so maybe from marketing side or from an operation side? Well, from both, both marketing and operations, there's only so much that I know, mm -hmm. and there's only so much that I can read, and there's only so much I can go look online. Mm -hmm. And I, I, they, are, they are really experts out there. They're really people that are, you know, they've gone to school for this. They've, ha they've had experience in this. But I think that the main thing that I really look for, it's not just about their experience mm -hmm. or their talent. It has to be a cultural fit. Mm -hmm. there, has to be an, there has to be an alignment with the vision of the company mm -hmm. in terms of what we're offering. If there is an alignment there, they could be the smartest person, they could have the best experience, but culturally it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that I'm always looking for is, is figuring out that cultural fit. And usually that, that, that works for me. Anyway, mm -hmm. that works for me. Basically, you know, even if we are delegating and elevating someone else to run that department or yeah. go with that, you still as a CEO kind of have to be involved in what's going on. So what are some of the ways that you're getting a first hand pulse on what's happening within that department and making sure that they're, they have the vision in mind, they're also yeah. hitting the targets uh, that you have set for the company. So what are some of the ways that you're accomplishing that? I'd say for me, it's becoming much more of an active listener. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I was all about making decisions and moving forward at, at a very quick pace. Mm -hmm. And I think where, where, what I've learned from that and how I keep myself uh, involved really is listening and actively listening. Because you know when you have eight people in a room, I may have the right mm -hmm. decision, but I, don't, I may not have the best answer. So I think that's what, I, what I've really been able to do is really get buy-in from the team and, and making sure that they do, that it is authentic, that they do feel that they're being listened to and when they make a decision, and it's okay if they make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I'm really about, actually if they don't make mistakes, that means they're not pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the learnings that we, that we learn from is actual mistakes along the way. Do you have like specific KPIs for each of the departments, specifically let's say for a marketing team or sales team that you actually have yeah. Uh, set and that you meet with? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely KPIs. There, mm -hmm. There's all those aspects in running a business mm -hmm. and they, they understand that, you know, there's a, there's a board, they, they can see, you know, what's going on mm -hmm. uh, in all aspects, how many, you know, data points, how many calls were made, how many appointments, how many interviews were made, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's, yes, it is, is it about numbers? Mm -hmm. Yes. But how are they achieving them? Are they doing it reluctantly mm -hmm. or are they doing it with passion? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's more about are they doing it with passion? Are they doing it because they feel good about what they're doing? It's not just about making another placement. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we differentiate. Most certainly. So one of the biggest lessons you learned is mm -hmm. like, hey, I can't be everything to everyone. I can't sure. run, you know, I can't be micromanaging, you know, some of those key areas such as, such as operations, marketing, yeah. things like yeah. that, finance. Um, and I was just looking at your CFO, he's been around 19 years, so obviously mm -hmm. that's a testament to the leader that you are. Yeah. So, and so you've, you've given the reign over to some of these internal resources sure. and you've elevated those people to do the job. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I was super um, amazed when I looked at the LinkedIn uh, profiles of some of your employees, they've yeah. been around with you forever, yeah. um, almost like 18, 19 years. Yeah. What, what's kind of the secret sauce behind how you're able to, to retain some of your core employees? I think, well, as the title of CEO, mm -hmm. for me that means Chief em Empathy Officer. Mm. So I, I, I do come to the table with empathy. I do, do understand where that person's coming from, but also you need to, under, uh, to understand the person. I call it the employee iceberg. Mm -hmm. So you have an iceberg, you know, on top everything's beautiful and mm -hmm. underneath there's all this stuff, right? <laughs> so underneath you really under, have to understand what, is, what are their key motivators? Mm -hmm. what, what is their family situation? What's going on in their lives? And you, to me, it's about understanding the, the whole person mm -hmm. and not, not just the employee. And I feel that maybe that's why that people have uh, stayed, only because they understand that they're in a place where uh, leadership listens, leadership mm -hmm. will understand where they're going, but also they're in an alignment with the purpose mm -hmm. uh, of us. And, 
at Artisan, we believe that we're inspiring better lives. Mm -hmm. And so are we inspiring better lives, not just for our clients, but for our talent and also internally? Mm. Do we help each other? That doesn't always work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but it does help because that, that's the foundation of who we are. And if, that, if you don't fit in culturally, uh, as they say, another tidbit is, uh, I, say, I would say culture destroys any kind of strategy. Mm. So if your culture isn't in alignment, it doesn't matter what kind of strategy you have, people aren't going to follow that strategy. Most certainly. Obviously, right. the idea that, hey, I can listen to my employees, um, right. probably practical when it's a smaller organization, but right. when you get to a scale, yeah. you can't probably have that one-to-one. -one. What are some of the things you're practically doing to make sure that you're finding time with your with your internal team and that you're getting to know them one-to-one? -one. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do have one-to-ones with my team. Mm -hmm. I can't have them with everybody, uh, you know, but I, when I do, I can. Mm -hmm. But it's really about my leadership team mm -hmm. right now that I have, that I have, uh, you know, my, my a director, a CFO, and then marketing and operations. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that feed in, in, into what I need. They, they give me the insight as to kind of what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives me the ability to uh, really work more on the business than in the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm fortunate enough that I have an amazing team and I'm at the stage, I guess, that I'm really not in the day-to-day -day, and I'm able to manage uh, the office uh, without being there every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I take about three months off in a year. So that's, that's pretty good, mm -hmm. I would say. You, I'm assuming you do probably a lot of traveling within those three months. Yeah, yeah. I definitely like when avid photographer, nice. I definitely to travel wherever I can around the world um, and and I take up new hobbies when I can. Mm. Uh, I think that's another thing I try to instill in employees is to try something new, is to get out of your comfort zone because mm -hmm. if you don't do that, you're never going to learn. You're not going to be better in what you're doing today. Yeah, most certainly. Yeah. I mean, obviously the fact that you were able to take three months off, that's it's an incredible mm. uh, success story right there. <laughs> because most often, you know, the biggest challenge entrepreneurs have yeah. is they just don't have enough time. Like they're yeah. working long hours, they're working every weekend. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's just, it's not, always, it's not always because it's all, the work demands it. Right. It's also that just the drive, right? Yeah. It's just driven, motiv you know, motivated people. And I think you have that work-life balance you figured out how you can do that. So what are some productivity mm -hmm. hacks that you've implemented in, for yourself that allows you to, uh, to get things done that are most important and the most, you know, most meaningful things and then still be able to have that kind of balance where you can, you can have such, such long, lengthy time off? Uh, I don't know if it's productivity hacks, but mm -hmm. being productive, definitely. I'm very productive with my time, mm -hmm. but it's also, we certainly invest in technology, certainly mm -hmm. invest in a great uh, ATS system, CRM systems, phone systems, to anything that we can to automate as much as we can mm -hmm. so that our recruiters and salespeople are really focusing on what they're good at and not being bogged down by the administrative uh, work that's mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that's, that's been a key. I, I think the other thing, uh, it's not technology driven, but it's more uh, from a, a mentorship aspect mm -hmm. that, that I uh, did have uh, a mentor mm -hmm. that worked with me for uh, 15 years that I meet with on a monthly basis mm. and that was through that was through Vistage mm. uh, and that was uh, that really helped me run uh, run a better business mm. and uh, and there was a great experience around the table and the other is uh, the uh, is EO which is the entrepreneur organization which is a peer-led group of entrepreneurs in Chicago and that also gives me time to get out um, there's monthly meetings mm -hmm. and that we we're, we're able to we're able to help each other not only on business but on personal aspects as well and they mm -hmm. and they definitely as entrepreneurs I, I think that uh, one, I'm really bad with deadlines, so mm -hmm. I will blow deadlines. I'm not held accountable. Mm -hmm. So when you do have a, a, a mentor or these types of uh, organizations, they hold you accountable, mm -hmm. and that has worked for me. So from a productivity standpoint, I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm going to be meeting them next month. I better get these things done that I said that I would, mm -hmm. and that's really helped me a lot. Are there specific things that you do on the business side? Mm -hmm. You said you also carry uh, a sales quota and you're also a sales leader there. Are yeah. there th some things that you do uh, to kind of have some organization, especially knowing that you, you're not very good with meeting deadlines? Yeah. What are some of the things that you do specifically to be more, more strategic about what you do in, in terms of being productive? Productive from, a, well, from a sales standpoint specifically, mm -hmm. uh, I, I I now have relinquished that role. Mm -hmm. I don't sell anymore. Uh, I used to be the rainmaker, mm -hmm. but that, that I haven't done in a long time. Mm -hmm. So really, me, it's about efficiently hiring great salespeople and keeping them. Mm -hmm. As you know, hire, when you make a mishire, especially in sales, it can cost you a lot of money. 
Uh, so I'm definitely about uh, paying more than the market share mm -hmm. and certainly giving them the opportunity to make good money, make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and I'm happy if they do, so that, that's not an issue. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think why, the, that's why it works. I think HubSpot did a study, they said the, uh, a bad sales hire is a BMW 7 Series. It could be about that, yeah, yeah. exactly. Because if they stay with you for eight months, nine months, yeah. you've already invested in training, paying the salary, and they haven't produced anything, so yeah. the sales management cost, the opportunity cost, and All whatever you're spending. Yeah, you're spending, <laughs> spending a lot of them, money. Yeah. <laughs> So you might as well just go buy a, a BMW 7 Yeah, series. might as well. I'd be better off that way. Yeah. Uh, and ob obviously not every salesperson works out, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it really comes down to transparent communication. You know, if you really don't know where they're coming from or wh what, their, what their motivators are, mm -hmm. you really need to know wh where they want. Do they want that? Do they want a condo? Do they want a boat? Do they, do they want to get out of school debt? What are those things? And then we'll try to break it down. Mm -hmm. Okay, if this is where you want to go and you want to get there in three years, well, we break it down to this is the activity that you need to mm. have mm -hmm. from the phone calls to the emails to the face-to-face -to, -face to networking to et cetera. And unfortunately or fortunately with, with technology, that's become difficult for mm -hmm. salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, it's harder and harder to get in front of people. So hence, we're going to use technology to fight technology, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of from a marketing standpoint, in terms of getting leads in, warmer leads in so that our salespeople can go and make that meeting. Uh, maybe I'm a little old school, but we certainly believe in the face-to-face -face appointment, mm -hmm. only because we're in the in the talent uh, in the talent aspect of uh, acquiring people. We need to understand the client's culture. We need to understand who they are, what they are, what their belief systems are, mm -hmm. in order for us to make that better match. And we can certainly match resumes. That's very easy. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to that human aspect, that's the hard part, and that's where we feel that we have. Uh, a step up. Mm -hmm. The yeah. fact that I think you just described what you do, you almost map out for anybody who works for you kind of a success path sure. in terms of achieving their dreams. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that, there's no reason for them to go find another home because yeah. you're helping them reach their goals and their dreams. And they may along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's about uh, making them the best person they can be while they're with me or mm -hmm. with the company. Mm -hmm. And if it's one year, that's great. If it's five, 10, 15, now I have one that's been 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 for me, it's about really educating them. It's about them feeling that they're part of, again, something bigger than just a job. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's more of a career. A little harder these days. Mm -hmm. uh, people do move around, and I feel that's okay too. But um, you know, you will find the right person eventually. Most certainly. Yeah. So obviously, you know, being in the business, you've had some tough lessons. What are sure. some quick wins that come to mind that um, that I think was kind of like a highlight of? some of your years in, in building a business. Getting on Inc. Uh, 500 in five years, we're number 147. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was exciting, that, that gave us great exposure. I was on the cover of Inc. magazine. Mm -hmm. So that, that, was, uh, that was my 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and then, the, as you mentioned, the Ernst & Young, uh, I was a finalist for that. Mm -hmm. And then the last five years so far, we've been uh, in Avero. We're listed as the top 2% of staffing firms in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's because our NPS score is so high, it's way above the average, both sides, mm -hmm. client side and talent side. So that, that's, that's been great. We really do enjoy that exposure. That's awesome to hear. So obviously you, you had, you know, a lot of mentors came alongside. Sure. You, you said you were part of the Vistage Group and yeah. an entrepreneurs organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so you firmly believe in, in receiving and then also giving advices. Yeah. What advice do you have for someone who might already have a business you know, kind of, you know, kind of learning the ropes of, uh, you know, building a company. What are some lessons that you have that you would, you would give someone? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, the ones that I, uh, that I always go back to mm -hmm. in the hard times, or especially when I be began the business, was, you know, if you're not in a, if you don't make yourself valuable, you're never in a position to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep that in mind. There has to be what's in it for the person that you're you're trying to get the business from. Mm -hmm. It's not a, what's in it for you. It's what's in it for them. Uh, I'd say also it's it's being I mentioned it, but it's also having a, a bigger picture, understanding what your why is. Mm -hmm. uh, really deep down, my, mine's for my why is for a bigger contributing to a greater cause. Mm -hmm. So everyone has a different why. If you're a Simon Sinek, yeah. uh, he, he, he's, he's a, all about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so figuring out what your why is, and then hopefully, and then you have to figure out what your company why is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's really, really important. Uh, and um, honestly, it's just being persistent. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, it, it, I look at this as a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get tired? Are you going to get exhausted? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what is it going to take you through those difficult times when you hit that wall? Mm -hmm. What is it going to pull you through? It's not money. Mm -hmm. It's other things that are going to pull you through. So it's that passion. It's understanding your why. Most certainly. So essentially, mm -hmm. uh, like most entrepreneurs, I think they yeah. they probably have you know they probably have a why, but then yeah. they get lost in translation once you get started. Sure. There's other priorities that come into the play, and then. Maybe they, after a while, maybe sometimes it's chasing the money yeah. and sometimes it's some other fame and some of those other stuff. Sure. But I think it's, it's really keeping a focus on, you know, ultimately, why are you in it? Yeah. And oftentimes, some, some of those guys might just get into it because they want to quit, you know. Hey, and that's fine. They, yeah. they do. They come in and out. They're, they're entrepreneurs do. They build a business three or four for four years, mm -hmm. two years. They sell and they're back in. And that's just, that, that just hasn't been my path. Yeah. yeah. And you've, you've held on to this thing for so, so many years. Yeah, a long time. Since yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've seen some companies in Chicago that I know some entrepreneurs that probably had five, six exits within that same time frame that you've right. kind of built this yeah, uh, yeah. from the ground up and actually been through the ups and, ups and downs uh, through that same pro, you know same time frame. Absolutely, D definitely ups and downs. However, it's it's been a great journey. It's given me uh, a great uh, opportunity to help people, to give people jobs, mm -hmm. uh, but also I've been able to pursue my dreams mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously yeah. You're, you say you're <laughs> photography and things like that. Yeah, um, I've heard you mention the 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 Start with a Why by Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. Are there other authors that you you love reading, especially from a business books or any other kind of books that you read? Good to great. Uh -huh. I mean that that's that was a, that has been a good one. Yeah, I think it's Double Double, like Cameron. I don't, uh, no. I've not heard that um, book. Yeah, it's called I, Double Double. I can't think of too many other mm -hmm. ones right now off the top of my yeah, head. Yeah, I mean, I think Good to Great is definitely one of those books, and yeah, yeah I do love Simon Sinek. Some of the books that he has published. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you said you have uh, some mentors that helped you. Um, sure. And someone who may not be like, okay, I, I think Vistage is, a, you know, for me it was a time commitment. Sure. You know, and obviously it's finance involved, and yeah. you have to pay for it. Well, why should someone as an entrepreneur find time for things like? You know, joining a peer group and and spending time to actually, um, you know, like spending the time and money needed sure. for, for an organization like that. Joining uh, an organization. For me personally, my own experience has been that it's it, mm, the investment that you make in, the, in a, especially find the organization that, mm -hmm. that works for you, is it pays back in spades. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that money that you spend is actually nothing compared to what you receive from it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to own your own your own experience, meaning that. You have to go in and go meet with people, talk to people, go to the speakers, do mm -hmm. all those things. So I would say it's, um, it's really key because there's only so much that you know as mm -hmm. an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have a mentor, that, that is someone that's already been in your shoes, mm -hmm. has seen the ups and downs, and can give you guidance. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to listen, mm -hmm. but at least there's guidance there, mm -hmm. right? The, the, then you can make a better decision. So these groups, what it enabled me to do is really to become a better decision maker mm -hmm. and, and really to avoid pitfalls that I, blind spots that you may have mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have ever seen if it wasn't for the people around the room. Mm -hmm. And they're all coming from all experiences. Uh, they're not in the industry, they're not in my industry, mm. but at the end, as entrepreneurs, we all come across certain uh, issues, be mm -hmm. it growing, be it firing, be it scaling, implementing new processes and procedures. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I feel that have helped me become a really good deci decision maker. Yeah, and That's also, what we do all day, right? Yeah. We have to make decisions. Yeah, most certainly. And I think, you know, sometimes the, you know, some, like we're all kind of have that arrogant mindset sometimes. Right. And, yeah. and you kind of need to get from, you know, hear from somebody else who's been there before and, and explain yeah. to them. And I've heard if you're trying to be a billion dollar company, then if you're trying to be a million dollar company, hang out with the people who built a billion dollar company because right. they will show you the, the short route right, to get right. there faster because yeah. they've already been there or past that, right? So yeah, hanging out with those people are, are extremely important in terms of kind of building your own um, skills and also improving yeah. on what, you've, what yeah. you may or may not know about. So um, let's just say, for example, you, if I were to give you a million dollars, and right. how would you invest that in sales and marketing today? What are some of the things that you say, hey, tactically or strategically, here's how I would invest it? Uh, well, definitely from a technology standpoint, got to understand what's happening out there. Where, where's I would say, where's the puck going? Where's mm -hmm. it going to be so you can get that hockey stick growth? Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely in, in technology, mm -hmm. uh, ha that has to get invested. And also, 
people. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really about people. If you don't have the right people in place, it doesn't matter how grandiose your idea is. Mm -hmm. People that are the ones that are going to take you there. So I would say really invest in, in the best people that you can hire. Mm. Uh, there are some amazing people out there. And from a staffing standpoint, most there are a lot of people that are, I'd say, are not um, engaged mm -hmm. workers, employees. They're, they're going to work. Mm -hmm. I'd say 70% of your employees are disengaged, mm. meaning that if a better opportunity comes up, they're going to go. Mm. And you've invested you know, some really good dollars into these people. So I'd say part of that money would be understanding and creating programs where how are you going to keep and, and uh, yeah, how are you going to keep these great people? Uh, mm -hmm. How are you going to, from a branding perspective, what are you saying out there, your messaging? You know, just because you have a ping pong table and mm -hmm. some foosball doesn't mean you're going to get great employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's just kind of like a bad idea. Mm -hmm. It's really developing and building this amazing company where people want to come. And if you do that, people will find you. Mm. You know, the word is going to get out there. People will find you. I mean, we're not going to be the Googles of the world. We're entrepreneurs. But you can certainly think and act in a way of attracting great talent and keeping them. Obviously, you built a great company. Right. You've been running it for over, over two decades. Right. <laughs> um, a great success story um, and a lot of lessons along the way. If you had to yeah. do it again, how would you do it again? How would you do it differently? I don't know if I would do it differently mm. because uh, you know at the time when I started it, I, I had a vision where people thought I was crazy, mm. and that young and 25 year old, year old with no money, uh, I don't know if I could have done it any different. So if I were anything differently, I would say I would be better at letting people go earlier. Mm. Yeah, that 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 was those are some big mistakes along the way is holding on to people that even though that you grow the business doesn't mean they have the capacity to stay with you. And that was difficult for mm -hmm. me because I, you know, we started together and we grew together, but it, it kind of, it, it overpassed them. Mm -hmm. So that was the one thing that I had to kind of, if I were to do differently, I would let, you know, in a, in a, in a humane way, mm -hmm. leave it, let, making sure people do leave with dignity, mm -hmm. that um, that would be, that would have helped. I think the book Good to Great talks about that, right? Mm -hmm. I think he said the, the right people in the right seat. Yeah. And if they're not in the, you know, if the right people aren't in the right seat, you know, either they're going to hold the company back or yeah. they're just going to become a roadblock altogether. Yeah, exactly. And there, yeah. Were, there were definitely a lot of roadblocks along my journey. So that, that I would do that. I would take away some roadblocks. Most certainly. Well, I appreciate you sparing this, sure. uh, this time with me. So I enjoy the conversation and wish you all the best. Yeah, you too. Thank, ah, you. thank you. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.